Hello everybody and welcome to the Caddleham Cymru revision session. Now this session this evening will focus on bonding and the first unit of the year 11 content for GCSE and it will be presented by Mr Black. Now Mr Black is a teacher in Penglais in Ceredigion. Now this session will last in the region of 45 minutes and in that session Mr Black will run through the relevant content with you. Now as you can see there is a section there where you can ask questions during the session now, please do use that q and a um, section and we'll do our very best to answer your questions as the session is progressing in that um, area as well you will see that there is a link um, which is designed and i we ask kindly that you fill that forms in that just collects very simple information about yourself when you've attended this session OK, so um, fee, as I said, feel free to use that Q&A to ask any question and I will um, endeavour to get Mr Black to address those questions as we go through. Now, this session will be recorded and the recording and any relevant resources that will be used by Mr Black during the session will be uploaded to the AirSkull website under the Caddleham Cymru um, tab. Now, thank you, Mr Black, and at that point I will transfer over to you. OK, great. Thanks for the introduction. So uh, yeah, this evening I'm going to be going over um, topic one, which you've probably all studied now, uh, hopefully, uh, which is the bonding module. And um, what I, I have actually done um, a topic on this. If you go and look on the Carlam sessions um, that are available uh, for GCSE, you'll see actually I do cover bonding. Uh, in one of those sessions. So if you're not quite sure of some of the bonding models, because I'll be going through them quite quickly today, uh, highly recommend you go and look at the previous sessions that we've done. Uh, the focus today for me is going to be on specifically how you answer questions. So the first session on bonding was kind of going for the theory. This is, you know, well, how do we answer questions? So um, just want to start off very quickly with uh, showing you some structures that you should be familiar with from topic one. And you can see here, so I do know this isn't actually kind of like focus on my my session today because my session's mainly about you know the extended responses, whereas here it's just a, a choice question. Uh, but it's a good starter for us because hopefully you recognise your different types of structure A, B, C, and D. So if you look at A, you hopefully identify it as metallic and B a simple molecular, which we tend to get with covalent bonding. Uh, C is your metallic. Oh, sorry, hang on. A is your metallic. <laughs> B is your simple molecular. Hopefully recognise C as being the ionic lattice. And finally, D looks like it's something like graphene. And you've been asked there to identify uh, what would represent potassium fluoride. And the key here is the potassium and fluorine. We know that potassium is a metal in its position on the periodic table, fluorine and non-metal. That should be ionic bonding, so hopefully identify that as being C. So let's get into the main part of what we're doing. What I thought I'd kind of focus in then is, is how you answer these extended questions. And it's kind of key areas that the examiner is going to be asking you about. And one of those key areas is, is about the melting points of substances. So this is what I, my question is going to focus on for initially. So here's a typical question. Um, we've got two substances, calcium oxide and we've got sodium chloride. And we can see there we've got well high melting points with the calcium oxide being appreciably higher than the sodium chloride. And if you read the question, it's asking us to explain, first of all, why do they have high melting points? So when you are talking about melting points, the first thing you need to do is establish well what kind of bonding would we see in this sort of substance and you can see here we've got calcium and oxygen and we've got sodium and chlorine and hopefully you recognize that both of those are where well, we've got metal and non-metal combining if you're not sure if it's a metal or non-metal of course you can look at your periodic table uh here's our kind of staircase that separates the metals from the non-metals and we've got our sodium and chlorine ionic and we've got our calcium and oxygen also ionic. So why is that important? Well, as I said, <clears throat> I have done um, a, a diagram here um, for um, bonding on previous modules. Um, actually, this is missing some electrons here. Uh, calcium's in group two, so I should really put two electrons on that calcium. So I'll have to add that onto the PowerPoint later. 
So you've got your group two element calcium and your group six element oxygen. OK, the oxygen's got its six electrons. Like I say, we should have two crosses on this calcium here, representing the um, electrons that the calcium has been in group two. And with it being ionic bonding, you know that this is what should be happening. So this is the mark scheme. Bear me a second. If we were to do a, this is what we should draw, sorry. So this is our ionic compound. So this is calcium oxide. And the key here is the charges. This is why they have a high melting point. OK. And so what I've done here then is I have put the uh, the ion sheet up here as well. Whenever you're doing questions about ionic bonding, always look at your uh, ion sheet just so you can get the charges straight as well. And there's a big clue here then about why we have high melting points on it compounds. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click over to the next slide. And you can see here once you form your ions. So remember on our dot and cross diagram, the calcium became a plus two charge and the oxide ion a minus two charge. And um, once we've done that, we, we form a lattice. So these ions are trapped to each other. Opposite charges are trapped and we get this lattice form. And the reason they have a high melting point is that these attractions are strong. All right, so we need to talk about the strength of these attractions between the opposite charged ions. And that's the case for both of these. So these are going to have strong attractions. These ions, the calcium ion, the oxygen oxide ion are going to have strong attractions. And so we need to talk about the energy needed to break those attractions. Now, if you look on the um, the mark scheme here, I'm going to have a little criticism of this mark scheme because you only get one mark for saying that you have to overcome the strong forces between the ions. Um, really, Whenever you talk about melting points, you need to talk about energy as well. So really a better answer there would be for the one mark that you have to overcome the strong attractions between the opposite charged ions, which needs lots of energy. Don't forget to talk about energy. Whenever you talk about melting point, refer to energy. And we go back to why the calcium oxide have a high melting point. Well, if you look at the lattice that's formed here, the ions, the sodium's got a plus one charge, it's in group one. The chloride ion, there's a minus one charge, it's in group seven. That's lost one electron, that's gained one electron. Whereas with our calcium that we saw the dot and cross earlier, the calcium lost two electrons, so it has a plus two charge, and the oxide ion has gained two electrons, so it has a two minus charge. So the reason the calcium oxide's got a high melting point, we have a bigger difference in charge between the ions and therefore a stronger attraction. And you know, I'm going to throw in, you need more energy therefore to break it. And I always like to talk about energy when I talk about melting points. So that's the answer to the mark scheme. OK, and in fact, actually, if you look on the mark scheme there, you can see that they've underlined more energy, that you need energy. So they want a reference to energy in the, in the answer. OK, so that was the ionic bonding. Um, like I say, all ionic compounds have high melting points due to the strong attraction between ions. Uh, we're going to look at another type of bonding now. So here's the question. Um, like I say, this would be on the uh, the uh, initial uh, presentation on bonding that I've done, and it's asked you to complete the diagram for fluorine. They've been very nice for you in the question. They've actually drawn the circles overlapping for you. You should know that fluorine is um, F2. And you should also know that the bonding between non-metal atoms is covalent. So hopefully you'd have been able to draw that yourself. Like I say, they have actually provided that in the question. So in terms of the covalent bonding, you should know that unlike ionic, which involves transfer of electrons, the uh, covalent involves sharing electrons. Fluorine is in group seven. So this means it has seven electrons. And hopefully you know that in order to become stable, it needs one more. So in covalent bonding, it has to invest um, electrons in order to gain electrons. So this fluorine needs to gain one more electron and in that case it's going to invest one of its seven electrons. So you can see that electron that the fluorine is investing and then it's got, because it's in group seven, we've got six remaining electrons. And then the other fluorine is exactly the same situation, it needs to gain electrons to become stable, it's got seven, so it'll invest one of its seven with the other six remaining. Okay, so make sure you can obviously draw your dot and cross diagram. Okay, uh, for oxygen, uh, similar kind of thing. Um, this time you've got uh, oxygen in group six. You can see this on the electronic structure. Again, they've drawn the circles for you in the question. 
okay but um you know options 02 so hopefully you would have known to draw two circles overlapping and um, this time with having six electrons it needs to gain each oxygen needs to gain two electrons so we'll start with this oxygen it's going to invest two of its electrons because it needs to gain two electrons you can't gain without investing uh, that means it's got four electrons that aren't being utilized so i'm going to put those there and it's same for the other oxygen okay so it invests two of its electrons and remaining four so the reason I've done those diagrams is because we need to talk about the melting points of these, these little molecules that we form or what we call simple molecules. I think you need to appreciate what a simple molecule is. OK, so that brings us on to this question here. OK, covalent bonds are formed by sharing pairs of electrons, which hopefully we've kind of established already. We've got two uh, structures here. We've got hydrogen on the left and we've got diamond on the right. And hopefully you recognize what these lines represent. These represent our covalent bonds. And you're asked to explain why diamond's got a high melting point. So <clears throat> again, hopefully you're gonna in your answer refer to energy. So why is it that hydrogen has that high melting uh, low melting point? In fact, a lot lower. And diamond has a much high melting point. In fact, one of the highest in the periodic table. Well, to melt. Uh, it's all again about energy and overcoming forces of attraction, just like it was in ionic bonding. So what are the forces of attraction we've got in diamond and hydrogen? Well, hopefully you know that hydrogen has weak forces between the molecules. Okay, So weak forces between these molecules. Oh, wait a second, it's gone forward. And you can see here, I've done this with carbon dioxide. I could have put hydrogen here, these could be hydrogen molecules. And we can see these weak forces between the molecules here. Um, these are what are broken when you are melting something or when you even turn it into a gas. OK, so melting or evaporating, you're overcoming these weak forces of attraction. And because the forces are so weak, we don't require much energy. Whereas if we go to diamond, diamond is actually made up of a giant covalent uh, lattice. All right. And each of these carbon atoms is joined by strong covalent bonds. So hopefully you can appreciate with these bonds being strong. To break this lattice, we're going to have to break many strong covalent bonds, and that's going to require lots of energy. OK. But just so, got across there just quickly, Mr. Black, just to okay. address the question. So just to get clarity on a people that wants um, explanation, whether you're breaking the bonds in the molecule when that is happening or not. Yeah, no, that's a really important question. So quite often when you uh, look at students answers, in fact, I had it in a class today when we were going over some revision. One of the students I asked them, in fact, I think it was this previous question. If I go back, I asked them why they uh, would say that hydrogen's got a low melting point. And they, they answered really well at the start. They said, so hydrogen's a simple, simple, simple molecule or made up of simple molecules. And then they said uh, <clears throat> the bonds are weak and so don't require much energy to break. And I knew what they were saying. I knew what they were saying. They were saying the bonds were weak and they were talking about the forces between molecules. I didn't like their answer because when they said the bonds are weak, you know, I think of bonds as being the covalent bonds. So I think, you know, just to make clarity in your answer, don't talk about bonds being broken when we're talking about simple molecular substances. Talk about forces between molecules. Um, if you say the word bond, I kind of think about this force of attraction between the two atoms, the covalent bond. When we talk about diamond, absolutely say bond. We are breaking covalent bonds in diamond. So I hope that clarifies that question. So moving on. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, great. So moving on. Um, another question then. Uh, this time we're looking at calcium chloride. It's, we're being told it's got a high melting point. Um, and hydrogen chloride is a gas at room temperature. So if we just have a think about this again, we've got to talk about energy and overcoming attractions. So the key to answering this kind of question is to look at what substance you're dealing with and clarify what kind of substance is it? Is it a simple molecular? Is it giant covalent? Is it um, ionic? Is it metallic? So if we look at this question here, calcium chloride, again, we go back to our periodic table. OK, and we know calcium is a metal and chlorine is a non-metal. We know this is ionic. OK, so that helps us with our question there. In a second, I'm not sure what's happened there. 
Okay. Whereas hydrogen chloride, well, one of the things I always tell my students, if hydrogen's bonding, it's going to do it covalently. So we know this is going to be simple molecular. So we've got a giant covalent. This is our calcium chloride. And we've got our simple molecular. So this is our hydrogen chloride. You can see the covalent bond there between the hydrogen and chlorine. And the, the point we want to make here is, <clears throat> as we've already said, ionic compounds have strong attraction or electrostatic forces or strong attraction between the opposite charged ions. Whereas if a simple molecular, although this covalent bond here is very, very strong and very difficult to break, it can be broken, it takes a lot of more energy than it does to break this weak force between the molecules. And it's this force between molecules that holds um, hydrogen chloride together, perhaps as a liquid or even as a solid if you get it cold enough. But because it's so weak, we don't need much energy to break it. So in that context, then what we're looking for in our answer. But bear me a second. So what we're looking for in our answer, if I go back to my previous slide. Okay, hang up. Get to the question. So we need to say that the calcium chloride is ionic, the strong force of attraction between the opposite charged ions, the hydrogen chloride, a simple molecular with weak forces between the molecules. And to finish off, I mean, it's only two marks. I'm going to say uh, the stronger the attraction, the more energy needed. OK, so I'm making reference to the bonding, ionic, simple molecular. I'm making reference to the force of attraction, strong force attraction between ions, weak forces between molecules. And finally, I'm making reference to the concept of using energy to break those attractions. OK. There we go. If you look at my lattice here, by the way, I couldn't find a picture where we were showing the charges, but you should know the calcium's in group two, so that's a two plus, and the chlorine's are minus one charge. So we have the opposite charged ions. <clears throat> right, I can't spell metals, obviously. Uh, explain the high melting point of metals, and which metal has a high melting point, sodium or magnesium, and explain your answer. OK, so this is introducing our idea now of another type of bonding model. We've done ionic. We've done covalent, so we're going to look at uh, metallic bonding there. So um, these are pictures uh, representing uh, our ionic bonding, uh, sorry, metallic bonding. Don't confuse it with ionic. Um, these are your positive metal ions, and these electrons have come from the outer shell or valence shell of the uh, group one metals. So you can see group one metal. Each one of them has got one outer electron that they've delocalized. Okay. And if we look at the group two metal, we can see uh, it's a similar situation, but being group two, uh, they have two valence electrons, okay, or two outer electrons. So when they form their metallic bonding, they delocalize two electrons per atom. So the first thing we're going to cover is the high melting point of both substances, relatively high anyway, especially for group one. So the reason for it being relatively high uh, is because of the attractions. Like any melting point, it's all about attractions. And if you look at the bonding model there, hopefully you can see that those attractions are between the metal ions, positive metal ions, and the negative free electrons. And the high melting point suggests that we need lots of energy to break those attractions. So if I was talking about the melting point here from a metal, I'd say they have high melting points as there's a strong attraction between the free electrons and the positive metal ions resulting uh, needing lots of energy to overcome. So then which would have the higher melting point, the group one metal or the group two metal? Well, I'm going to give you a moment just to think for yourself. I'll have a drink of water again. OK, so hopefully using your intelligence, you've come up with the idea that the group two metal, so like magnesium that's in group two would have the higher melting point. You see it's significantly higher here. And hopefully you've come up with an idea that, again, it's a bit like the ionic bonding. It's a bigger charge attraction. OK, so we've got a greater charge on the magnesium and therefore stronger attraction to the free electrons. And therefore it's going to require more energy to break that lattice. Okay. So we're going <clears> to <throat> move on from melting points. We've talked about melting points of ionic. Um, we've talked about melting point of simple molecular. We've talked about the melting points of uh, giant covalence okay, um, and metals. Another thing that examiners really like talking about is conductivity. 
And I think the first thing we need to know about conductivity, especially of electricity, is is that what is current? What is the you know conductivity of electrical charge? So current is actually the flow of charge. <clears throat> You're probably used to it just being of uh, electrons, although hopefully from the chemistry, you know it's more than just electrons that can carry charge. So as I've said here in the next statement, uh, that those charged particles, they you know typically are free electrons. In most cases they are, but it can also be ions. Remember, ions are charged particles. OK, so here's a very, very typical question that we get in examinations. Describe the electrical conductivity of an ionic solid. Now they might say an ionic solid or they might give you a substance like magnesium chloride or sodium chloride and you'd have to recognise that it's ionic. So if we were to describe the electrical conductivity here then, um, how would we do that? OK, well, let me second. Let's go back. So if I was describing the electrical conductivity of an ionic solid, um, I would say they can't conduct as a solid. That's the first thing you need to say. And the second thing you need to say is when they can conduct. And you need to say they can conduct when molten or dissolved. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment, OK, because uh, we'll, we'll explore the importance of the or word, because that's very important for us. OK, so let's look at a typical question here. This is a QER question. Difficult to get marks, although this is, should be fairly straightforward for you. Uh, you've first of all been asked to been told what the properties of magnesium chloride are. Uh, we've got the high melting point and you can see here that it's described the conductivity of the of magnesium chloride. And I just want to talk to you about that word describe. What lots of people will try and do in that question is they'll try and explain. You don't need to explain and you're not going to get any marks to explain. That comes on in a moment. You have to, when you describe something, it literally says, this is what it does. This is, you know, it. and so for us, for example, if we're describing the conductivity, can when it's um, molten or aqueous or dissolved, can't when it's a solid. That's all you have to do. Now, if you look at the next bit, the, pro, uh, the uh, question, we've got to describe the, uh, the bonding and then explain its properties, i.e. the melting point and the uh, conductivity in terms of what you end up saying the bonding is. So magnesium chloride, <clears throat> as you know, is ionic, or hopefully you know, metal, non-metal. And, you know, I've done a quick diagram there for you. These are the ions that you form. Magnesium in group two, so it's lost two electrons, and the chlorines have gained those electrons, okay? One for each chlorine. So you can see that these crosses and originally belong to the magnesium. I say watch the first video that I did back oh, quite a while ago. OK, so that's the first thing we've done. We, we could do a quick dot and cross diagram uh, that would pick you lots of marks up where you show the transfer of electrons from the magnesium to the chlorine. That's great. I don't want to spend too long on that. Because what I want to do is um, talk about the melting point. Well, we've already talked about the melting point, haven't we? So this is uh, this is the lattice we have for magnesium chloride. Interestingly, you see it's a bit different to the lattice that we might draw for something like um, sodium chloride. That's because of the number of chlorines we have relative to magnesium. If you were to count these up, by the way, for every magnesium ion, you would find there's two chlorines. All right. So I think there's some like 24. Um, magnesium, so there'll be 48 chlorines in that structure. Anyway, the melting point, easy. We know the melting point, okay? So why has it got high melting point? Well, the high melting point is due to the strong forces. I mean, they've said strong ionic bonds. I, I like to say strong electrostatic forces or strong attractions between the opposite charged ions. Notice in the um, mark in here, they've highlighted the word energy to talk about splitting them apart. OK, so that we've we've talked about melting points already. It's the conductivity I'm interested in. So can it conduct? Well, we've already described the conduction only when it's molten or dissolved. And it's this word or that I want to explore with you. OK, um, today, um, again, doing some revision, one of my pupils said um, they can conduct. They can't conduct as a solid. Great. Um, but they can when they're molten or liquid. And it was like, no, OK, that's not going to get the mark. And the reason is molten means melted. And when you melt something, it becomes a liquid. All right. You need to say melted, molten, 
liquid or dissolved aqueous or solution you have to say both one involves melting i heat the other involves water so it's very very important you say both and let's just have a quick look at the mark scheme here okay you can see it conducts electricity in molten or in solution another way of saying that is conducts when liquid or dissolved or you could say or aqueous you know it's lots of different ways of saying the same thing but make sure you say one is where you've melted it and the other is where you've dissolved it and then there you can see that we finish off by saying the reason it can conduct is that the ions when they are molten or dissolved are free to move and carry the electrical charge it can't when a solid as the ions are immobile you need to say all of those things to get the full marks okay so the next thing we're going to do then is talk about conducti conductivity especially of electricity uh, in terms of free electrons so lots of things can conduct <clears throat> with um, when they have free electrons so if you've got free electrons in your structure they'll be able to conduct electricity um, so the things I'm thinking of are things like carbon nanotubes graphene graphite and you can see here I've put a question mark on buckyballs and we'll talk about why in a moment uh, just covering another aspect of the properties it's not only conduction of electricity as well of metallic don't know why that's come up by itself all these have free electrons so they should all be capable of conducting electricity uh, and also thermal energy so they're good conductors of heat as well so let's look at some typical questions we get about conductivity then so we've got graphene and graphite are different forms of carbon hopefully you could recognize those structures without being told what they are and it says explain how the bonding present in both forms makes some good conductors of electricity and we've got two marks here okay so why two marks well first of all hopefully you know that graphene and graphite both have free electrons but we need a bit more. All right. So let's just have a quick look at why they have free electrons, because if we go back to the question, let's put it back up. It does explain, does explicitly state, explain how the bonding present makes them good conductors. So we know they've got free electrons. That's going to get some mark. Where's our second mark come in? Well, let's look at carbon. So carbon, we can see is in group four, suggesting it's got four out of electrons. OK. There we can see four electrons on the carbon atom, outer electrons only. OK, and therefore this allows it to have free electrons and we'll explain why. So if you look at the carbon atoms in this graphite, we can see each carbon is bonded to three other carbons. Now, if you go back, I'll just go back, actually, if I go back and just look at our atom of carbon you can see actually technically to become stable it would want to make four covalent bonds and we look at our structures for graphite and graphene we can see that the carbon has only actually utilized three of its electrons for making covalent bonds and the fourth electron has been delocalized or is free and that that kind of needs to be talked about in our answer okay so you can see here there's our three our carbon joins three other carbons those are its delocalized electrons. And you can see there that they're moving. That's our movement of charge, our current. So if we look at graphene, okay, which is also a form which is actually involved in the question, graphene is the same. You can see it's got three, car three um, bonds to each carbon, whereas the fourth electron that carbon has, it's also delocalized, okay, free to move. Um, looking at carbon nanotubes, Another substance that can conduct electricity. So you can see here, there's our carbon nanotube. We'll talk about those a bit more in a moment. And here's our delocalized electrons. Again, look at each carbon, three bonds to the carbon with their fourth electron delocalized, making a good electrical conductor. Okay. And this is why we can, you know, think about carbon nanotubes for use in computers, TV screens, all sorts of electronic applications. Okay. So <clears throat> how do we talk about this then in terms of the question? So we, how do we explain the bonding present in both forms? So the way we do that is we talk about the number of bonds. So each carbon is bonded to uh, three other carbon atoms and the fourth electron is delocalized and is able to move. OK, so you get a mark for talking about delocalized electrons, but you do need to talk about the number of bonds in graphite, in graphene, 
and in carbon nanotubes. OK, uh, another question that gets asked about properties is hardness and malleability. OK, so we'll start off with why metals are malleable. So there's our metallic structure again. And we can see that basically if we apply a force, the metal ions can slide into new positions. So I'll just show you there now. So if I apply a force here, those metal ions can slide in new positions. And we actually haven't broken any metallic bonds. Right, so we're not actually breaking anything. So um, that's why they're malleable. So very simply, you can just say the ions slide into new positions without any metallic bonds being broken. These electrons are like a constant presence. They're always pulling the ions into their new positions. So is graphite malleable? Well, you might think so. In fact, quite often I see people say in exams that graphite's malleable. And the reason they think it's malleable is because the air layers can slide over each other bit like we saw with our uh, metal. However, that doesn't make graphite um, malleable. Graphite is far from malleable. OK, graphite is described as soft and slippery, and that's because these layers can slide over each other. But don't say malleable, and I've seen that quite often. So in the exam, <clears throat> they'll quite often ask you to explain why graphite's soft and slippery. And you all, all you need to, well, there's two things you need to say in that sort of question. The weak forces between the layers allow the layers to slide over each other. And you need to say both things to get two marks. And it's usually worth two marks. OK, so weak forces between layers allow layers to slide over each other. OK, let's uh, move on. So how do you describe diamond? Is it soft? Is it malleable? No, it's neither of those things. In fact, it's the hardest substance known to man. And the reason it's got that hardness is because it's got four strong covalent bonds. And the key point here is that they're in all directions. All right. Unlike your graphite, if we go back to graphite. We can see here that we've only got strong bonds within the layers. We haven't got strong bonds between the layers, just these weak forces. So if you ask to explain why diamond's hard, um, you'd be talking about there that they've got these four strong covalent bonds in all directions. And that gives this really rigid lattice. OK, so. Moving on. We'll talk about um, another area of topic one now. These are your new materials. So we're going to start off talking about typical questions you might see with nanoparticles or nanomaterials. So here's a question about um, titanium dioxide. Um, <clears throat> there's three things we're being asked to do. Uh, I'm going to focus on these two here. First of all, why do we use nanotitanium dioxide? And also, why are we worried about using things like nanotitanium dioxide? We'll also cover here um, nanosilver as well. So, for example, we need to know about both nanoparticles, nanosilver and nanotitanium dioxide. So, the first thing we'll cover is well, what is a nanoparticle? Uh, really important, this comes up lots and lots of times. What's a nanoparticle? Um, <clears throat> they're particles that range between one to 100 nanometers. Now, I said no larger than 100 nanometers. If you look at MART schemes, they need to say between one and 100 nanometers. And if we look at um, nanogold, which you don't really need to know about the exam, but I've got a nice picture of a nanogold particle. This is what we call bulk gold. Okay, So it's like uh, what we typically experience gold as. Um, but if we break these, you know, down into smaller and smaller pieces, so it looks like file it down and then get it even smaller and smaller and smaller, then we can get to this kind of scale here. This is typical nanoparticle. Each of those little circles you can see there is a gold atom. And it fits right in our category of nanoparticle because, you know, we're looking at, I don't know, what's that? Estimate maybe six to eight nanometers. I think I've said 10 here, probably a bit overestimating there. But the, the thing you need to know about nanoparticles that makes them kind of special is that they have an absolutely massive surface area mm. because they're so small. Most of their most of them is surface and this affects how they behave, especially how they behave with light. OK, so one of the things that we notice with nanoparticles. Is they have different properties and one of the properties might be their colour. OK, so nano gold is actually, um, you know, you've got, I'm not sure, yeah, we've got green here, right? Make it to 50 nanometers. The main thing being is that the, the particles behave differently. So what do you need to know for the exam? Well, you need to know about nanotitanium dioxide and nanosilver. 
Um, the thing you need to know about nanotitanium ductile, this goes back to our question, is that it's transparent. OK, so it reflects UV light, but it's transparent. And I'm just going to explain to you why that is, because it's worth perhaps understanding why it is. <clears throat> if you look at your, um, this is what I'd call sunblock. And sunblock um, reflects UV light, which is good. We don't want to absorb UV light. UV light can cause skin cancer and it also reflects visible light. OK. Now there's a problem with this kind of um, sun cream. You look like that. Okay, as you can see here, what's happening is that your visible light, well, your UV light's being reflected off, okay, which is great. We don't want sunburn, uh, but also it's reflecting the visible light and that appears white, okay, because it's hitting your eyes, all the wavelengths of light hit your eyes and it appears that you've got like some white paint on your face. Now, nano titanium dioxide still reflects the UV light, but it allows the visible light to be absorbed. And that means that the visible light doesn't bounce off your skin and therefore it appears colour. So you can you know, rub the nano titanium dot side in and it will be transparent. So if we go, oh, another, I've just put this on here as well, just because it mentions the syllabus. We also put nano titanium dot side in sort of cleaning glass. So it's worth knowing that's in sun cream and sort of cleaning glass. And the reason it's in sun cream is it's transparent. And the next thing you need to know about nano, and then we'll come back to the question, is that the people are really concerned about nanoparticles, increasingly concerned. And the reason for that is that we're worried about how readily absorbed they are into the body, because these particles are so small, they can pass through the skin, easily enter the body. And what we don't know is what effect they're going to have on health. And I need to talk to you about that in a minute. OK. You can see here, you know, it's been linked or nano titanium dioxide has been linked to as uh, cancers when inhaled and also um, when absorbed into the blood. Now, whether that's the case or not is not quite sure yet. We're going to need to do some more research. So let's look at the questions then. Give the advantage uh, and what are our concerns? And we look at the mark scheme. You can see here transparent rather than opaque. Uh, they do accept clear rather than white. Then the concern. OK, is that they can pass through the skin or get into the blood or into the body easily. And this is the point I want to make here. Why are we worried about them? Do not say they are poisonous or they cause cancer or, or they could cause cancer um, because um, we wouldn't be selling sun creams if they could cause cancer. All right. We just would not be allowed to do it. What we don't know, and the best thing for you to say is, and you can see here, look, neutral answer, toxic poisonous, they're not going to say that. It's the long term effect. That is the key word. Long term effect is unknown. So don't say they're toxic because you won't get mark. OK. Uh, nanoparticles, uh, also we get, uh, need to know about nano silver. Uh, you can see here, um, we need to underline the correct size. So we've already said that it's one to 100 nanometers. OK. And as I've said to you earlier, when you get down to these sort of really massive surface areas of nanoparticles, their properties are different. So the question then asks us, what's the um, property of nanosized silver particles as we're using plasters, socks and deodorants? So you can see there they're using socks, they're using plasters and they're using deodorants. And the answer is they are antimicrobial. OK, so I've just done a little image there. You can see that these nanoparticles can easily pass through the cell wall of bacteria and their cell membrane, and then they interrupt how the enzymes work. Okay, so obviously, if they can pass through the cell walls of um, bacteria, there's that potential that they can pass through this, our skin and into our cells, and we don't know what damage they're causing. But the key point here for that question was that nanosilver is antimicrobial. It kills bacteria, it kills viruses, uh, fungi and molds. And if you go back to my previous slide, you can see that's why they also use it in fridges. OK, it stops bacteria and molds growing on the surface. It's used in sterilising sprays in hospitals. It's used in deodorants. You're applying it directly to the skin. A bit scary if it's easily absorbed. And the reason it's in socks or plasters to stop um, infections <coughs> in wounds and in socks uh, and in deodorants, it's actually killing the bacteria 
that cause sweat to become give off the body odor smell. Okay, it's, sweat doesn't have a smell as such. It's the bacteria that eat the sweat that give off a smell. So if you can kill those bacteria. Yes, you'll have a sweaty smell, but not the body odor smell. Okay, and then we're going to finish off by looking at these substances, fullerenes. So what is fullerene? Uh, well, let's look at the question first. So why are they used as catalysts? Uh, why do we oppose their use in um, drug delivery systems of the body? And finally, this question about are they good electrical conductors? So what's a fullerene? Well, a fullerene, it's a carbon structure that's hollow. OK, so they've got to be hollow to be a fullerene. That's why graphene that we looked at earlier with conductivity is not classed as a fullerene. It's two dimensional. It's flat, it's one atom thick. Um, so there's a carbon nanotube. The other type of fullerene, that we get, okay, maybe a second. The other type of fullerene we get are these, they're called buckyballs or Buckminster fullerene. And again, you can see this hollow shape. And um, yeah, they, these are basically nanoparticles. So a buckyball is about the size of one nanometer. And one of the uses they talk about with buckyballs is that um, we can put medicines inside them. So the first thing we've been asked about is why are they used as catalysts? And the reason is because they have a massive surface area and have a massive surface area, as you know, with rates of reaction, helps speed up reactions. OK, and here you can see I've got a medicine encapsulated in my buckyball. We'll talk about that in a second. So there's our mark scheme. Why do we um, you want to use them as catalysts? It's because of that large surface area. Why are we worried about them? As we said, these are nanoparticles. They can easily enter our cells and pass into our skin, and we don't know what their effects are. And finally, can they conduct? Well, there's a yes and a no. Um, if you go and look back at their structure, okay, you can see that they've got three carbons, whereas the fourth carb, fourth electron, uh, uh, where's the, sorry, got three bonds, Where's the fourth electron that carbon has? It's delocalized, but it's delocalized within the buckyball itself. So if you look at what the examiner's accepted. They can say, yeah, good conductor. It's got delocalized electrons. Or you can say not a great conductor because the electrons are trapped within the ball structure. And they, they like both answers there because you made reference to delocalized electrons. Anything that conducts has got delocalized electrons unless it's ionic. Just very quickly then. Finishing off and to see what my time is. Yeah, I've got a couple of minutes. The last kind of material uh, we need to talk about are smart materials. So we've got some lens, uh, some glasses here, and it's asking you about the kind of material you'd use to make the frames and the lenses. So I'll just quickly go through what a smart material is. Uh, the materials whose properties reversibly change in response to change the environment. There's different types that we've got written down here: photo, thermo, shape memory alloys, and polymers and polymer gels. Shape memory alloys, uh, their property is that they change shape in response to temperature. So they can remember a shape and go back to that shape and you, uh, change their temperature to a particular temperature. We got um, a shape, good uh, example of this is something called nitinol, it's an alloy of nickel and titanium. And we use these shape memory alloys in all sorts of things. So we've got the spectacle frames, we've also got them in the wire of these, these uh, braces. Okay, so these, uh, this is a shape memory alloy that's programmed to your body temperature and it remembers the shape that the dentist wants your teeth to go to. We've got them in sprinklers, so when this sprinkler gets hot, this changes shape, it straightens out and smashes this ball, which allows water to flow through the sprinkler. And we also see them in um, thermostats. They allow the current to be turned on and off. Okay. Is another shape uh, type of smart material. These change colour in response to changes in temperature. So we've got kind of novelty uses, for example, mood rings. Here we can see it painted on the wall or mugs. Uh, we've got safety, so things like a bath toy, so you can see if the water's too hot or a feeding spoon. Oh, there's your mood rings there, that's another novelty use. Uh, we've got thermometer strips and we've also got uh, battery test strip indicators. So these things change colour in response to temperature. OK, and then we've got photochromic materials and these are used in reactive lenses. So these are lenses that change colour in response to light intensity. So let's go to our question. Oh, polymer gels, mm, they just absorb large amounts of water, but don't say they absorb water. Say they absorb huge amounts of water, a thousand times their weight. A sponge absorbs water. These absorb massive amounts of water. OK. 
shape memory polymers. They're a bit like shape memory alloys, but they're plastics. And they're used in like things like car bumpers that, you know, if you get a dent, you can remove the dent with a bit of heat. OK, so you perhaps pour hot water from a kettle, or use a hairdryer and the dent will pop up. Uh, bear me a second. So let's go to our question here. Um, give the names of the types of smart material used and the property of each. So hopefully you've worked out the frames being bent. So this is a shape memory um, alloy. OK, and uh, the reason it's being used uh, the property is it changes shape in response to temperature. OK, and for the lenses, hopefully you recognise that the lenses have changed colour. So hopefully you recognise that this is a photochromic material and it's going darker with light conditions or light intensity. If you look at the mark scheme, you can see there on the mark scheme. I think that with the shape memory alloy, it, it regains shape after heating or changing temperature. I, I, I think really you do need to say both there. And for the lenses, photochromic and it's changing colour with the light intensity. So that's me done. Bit of a rush, but um, finished. So I hope that was useful to you. Thank you, Mr Black. Um, now, I hope you all found today's session useful. Now, next week's session will um, be presented by myself and be focusing on the second unit, which is the ASSES unit. And hopefully I'll be able to use my experience as an examiner to give you a bit of a push in the right direction with how to approach exam questions based on ACID. So we hope to see you all then.